This is Fisher Frying Products. I'm Dave Hertner. Welcome to The Nest. Our video newsletters provide weekly insight into building and flying our 15 wooden aircraft designs. Polini Motori of Italy is a gracious sponsor of our channel. Polini is the manufacturer of the Thor 250 DS, a two-stroke liquid-cooled 36 horsepower engine that is used in all of our single seat designs. Please take the time to watch our videos to the end as this assists us in the metrics that YouTube uses to rate our channel. Hit the like button if you feel that the content is worthy. We invite you to subscribe to our channel by clicking on the subscribe button and hitting the bell so that you are notified whenever we post our newsletters. Hello everyone and welcome to The Nest if it's your first time. Welcome back to all of our subscribers. We've been contacted by the winner of our 1,000th subscriber promotion. Congratulations go out to Jim Keeney from Fairbanks, Alaska, he who has asked for a set of plans for our Horizon 2. We've also been contacted by Don Casper, who is one of the five free t-shirt winners. We're still waiting to hear from Jerry Yarish, Mitchell Alexander, Cameron Bunting, and Mac Miller. So. If uh, you're one of those guys, give me a call at 519-933-2055 or contact me at davidfisherflying.com to get the free promo code to get your t-shirt from our web store. Today's presentation will be reading an article that was just released in Microflight Flying Magazine. This content has been used with permission and I read the article while the actual flight test footage plays in the background. We're very thankful for the effort put forth to validate the performance of the FP404 in the UK SSDR category. Peter Kelsey from Ferry Air has been very instrumental in the navigation of the SSDR paperwork and educating pilots and builders in the UK on the benefits of that category. The words I will be reading in this segment are from Adrian Jones, the test pilot of the 404. I thought that the text from the article would be better suited uh, as a narration of the video instead of simply hearing the buffeting noise of the air flowing past the camera. I hope you enjoy seeing the FP404 flown and put through its paces. Enjoy. Well that was baptism by fire. Not the flying you understand, that was easy peasy. No, I mean taxiing out from the hangar onto the airfield with David Balbert, the owner, leading the way in front of a whirling propeller. He had a totally unjustified belief in my rudimentary tail dragger skills. Still, it wasn't too demanding even for someone who doesn't do a lot of tail dragger flying. The 404 showed no signs of wanting to nose over or ground loop. As you can see from the video and photos, the Fisher FP404, a diminutive open cockpit SSDR staggered wing biplane with beautiful classic lines is what we're talking about. Wing area is 120 square feet, but the span's only 18 feet, and the length 14 foot 6 inches. This one is especially well made and finished, built from plans by the fastidious owner builder Walter Paderni, who delivered it from Italy to Sackville Farm in a modest van. Once assembled and checked over, he then flew it to put it through its paces for David to admire from afar since sadly David hasn't finished his flight training yet. Still, there's plenty of time for that. David's only 75 after all. I'm the first Brit to fly the FP404 in the UK, and this review is another UK exclusive. It was a close call for me though. Other test pilots like David Bremer, who is well over six foot tall, went to look at it but couldn't fit in the cockpit. Leg room is only 114 centimeters, and neither could Bob Grimwood. I like to think that they were just too scared when they saw how small the airplane was. Before getting into the cockpit, I gave the aircraft a good pre-flight inspection, as I always do with any type new to me, especially one that's not regularly flown. I needn't have worried, though, as everything was pristine, and I could tell just by looking that it was a well-considered and strong design. Even though it's 15 years old, it looked almost brand new. Walter, who runs his own composites business, making parts for boats, is evidently a perfectionist. 
From the outside, the strength of the wing, lift, interplane, and conveying struts is clearly evident. The tailplane and fin are well braced by cables. With its short span, it looks capable of the claimed plus 6G and minus 3G load limits. So a loop would be a doodle, legalities permitting, provided that the 503 is capable of overcoming all that drag. Glide ratio and hence lift to drag ratio is unsurprisingly low at only 7.1 at 40 knots. Full span ailerons are fitted to the lower wing. The push rods from the joystick emerge from the underside of the cabin and through a series of bell cranks operate the control surfaces through horns on the top surfaces. The elevator push rod is also routed from there and there is little play or friction in either circuit. The rudder and sprung tail wheel are operated via cables as are the toe brakes which are much easier to get used to than heel brakes. Rudder and elevator are large enough to provide enough control power at low speeds. The undercarriage is a homemade bent aluminum beam fitted by Valter as a replacement for the usual bungee arrangement. This is much less draggy and more attractive in my view. The brake cables run neatly down the trailing edge of the beams and the wheels are fitted with very close fitting spats so clearance might be a problem on some muddy strips. The two fuel tanks are located in the top wing with fuel taps accessible on the underside from the cockpit. They hold a total of 10.8 US gallons. Walter made an extra tank that looks like a first world war bomb that holds an additional 4.2 gallons. It can be slung under the fuselage between the main wheels. The extra fiberglass container on top of the engine though is the 404's secret weapon. It's the oil reservoir for the smoke system. Just below the tank is an electric pump which injects oil into the top of the exhaust can. This produces an impressive plume of white or colored smoke out of the long tailpipe. It was a bit remiss of me not to try it out on this flight. It all looked good to go so I donned David's flying suit to keep my bits from snagging on the controls. He also lent me a flying hat and a pair of goggles to complete the ensemble. And did I look dashing? Well, not really. Entry into the 22-inch wide cockpit is not too difficult as there's a very useful handle in the central cutout in the top wing. There's ample room once in except that the joystick hit my right knee before reaching the aileron stop. The position of the throttle lever meant that I couldn't move my leg any further to the right. Still, I prefer left-hand turns and in fact that was the first thing I had to get to grips with. The throttle is on the right-hand side so it was left hand on the joystick, which I'm not used to. All the controls came to hand easily. The choke is just below the handsome throttle lever, with the manual elevator trim lever just below that. I would relocate all of these on the left of the cockpit if it were my airplane, because I like to have my right hand on the joystick. If you're used to a left hand stick, it would suit you to a T. For a 5 foot 11 pilot, the eyebrow over the top of the instrument panel sticks out too far and I had to lower my eye line to read the top instruments. This is probably because it was built by an Italian and I expect that Walter built it for his own physique. He's a little shorter than me at 5 foot 8. On starting the engine I was immediately at home as it is a trusty Rotax 503. This engine doesn't have a cooling fan because the tractor prop is best suited to do that job. I think the fan absorbs about 3 horsepower at high revs, so without it there must be more power. I've never seen this acknowledged though in any official figures. In my shadow, the 503 would cook without a cooling fan. The 503 ran smoothly except at the very low idle speed that it was set at. We tweaked that a bit after my flight, which showed up another drawback. The engine cowl has to be taken off to do any routine engine maintenance and there are quite a few screws to undo. However, that's true of many aircraft. As the engine is mounted inverted, it's important not to use more choke than is absolutely necessary to keep the spark plugs from being flooded. No priming is needed because the tanks are far above the carbs and for that reason it's important to turn off the fuel taps after landing. There are two EGT sensors feeding a combined gauge and one CHT sensor shown on a gauge which also incorporates the rev counter. This is marked with a white line for cruise at 5500 RPM and a red line at 6800 RPM. In flight, 
I found that the CHT was well within limits at all power settings, but the EGTs were on the edge of the red zone most of the time. Good for fuel efficiency, but a bit too high for engine longevity. This is obviously just down to a lack of cooling air flowing past the exhaust manifold. A small deflector inside the cowl and a slightly larger outlet hole around the manifold should sort that out. In unusually calm conditions, taxiing to the runway hold position was no problem. The tail wheel is very effective and there are always the differential brakes to fall back on. After last minute checks, I lined up and decided to go for a takeoff. I think it's best to get away from the ground as quickly as possible and not to spend too much time practicing fast taxiing with a tail dragger. The tail came up almost immediately and we were airborne in about 10 seconds. This could be reduced with more experience in the airplane. The takeoff run was well below 325 feet and I don't think it could be held on the ground much more at that distance. It just wants to fly. The fixed pitch propeller is relatively large in diameter at 66 inches and a fine pitched at 34 inches. This lends to good efficiency for low speed, especially takeoff. I was expecting it to be noisy but even with a tip speed of Mach 0.68 at 6800 RPM, it wasn't noticeably louder than my shadow with a tip speed of Mach 0.54. The difference is that on the shadow, the prop sits in turbulent air behind the rear bulkhead. A gentle climb out followed as I was being cautious. It proved extremely easy to fly and it naturally found its own climb speed at around 57 miles per hour. Although, as all of the instruments are in metric, it took a bit of mental arithmetic. Into the circuit and on the downwind leg, I started to look for the hot air balloon that had launched some time before me. Sackville has a busy assortment of activities, including GA, microlights, vintage, and a bit of gliding, and on a calm day, lots of ballooning. It didn't take long to find the little dot in the distance, and a few minutes later, I was closing in on it, just to the east of now-closed RAE Bedford. I gave it a wing waggle to show the balloonists that I had seen them, and then I got a surprise as the balloon started to climb rapidly. Even at the 404's max climb rate of 900 feet per minute, I found it difficult to keep up until I topped out at 3,000 feet. All this time I had been getting used to the handling and experimenting with more and more control deflection, but now it was time to get back to the flight review. All the basic stability requirements are met by the Fisher FP404, Static stabilities in pitch, roll, and yaw are all normal and well damped, as you would expect. Dynamic stability is also satisfactory. Short period oscillation in pitch is soon damped out by the large tailplane. The long period fugoid oscillation, which exchanges speed for height and then height for speed in a porpoising motion, takes a few cycles to die out to nothing, which is perfectly normal. By contrast, Dutch roll, which is excited by pumping the rudder repeatedly left and right, stops dead as soon as the rudder is centralized. The wing tip motion is always elliptical when viewed from the cockpit, but in this case, it was a very flat ellipse because there isn't a great deal of secondary roll due to rudder. Even so, it's possible to steer with rudder alone in calm conditions. Spiral mode is slowly divergent as in a lot of microlights and light aircraft. For such a small airframe, it is not particularly twitchy and doesn't require especially quick reactions as some small SSDRs do. Everything is well damped by the large aerodynamic surfaces. This doesn't mean that it's sluggish though, far from it. It can be maneuvered quite quickly. At under 35 miles an hour, the stall is quite benign, with just a gentle but consistent drop of the left side wings. Less than 100 feet altitude is lost. Tight turns require very little back pressure on the control stick and control forces remain light. The 404 does lovely wing overs and gentle aerobatics, which is entirely legal in an SSDR, as I like to point out in every SSDR review. The cruise speed isn't anything to write home about, and in my opinion, the figures for cruise and max speed in the spec panel are optimistic. I recorded 63 miles per hour at 5500 RPM and a max level speed was not much more than 75 miles per hour. But then, this isn't an A to B aircraft. It's a fun machine designed to be thrown about with abandon. No one is going to break it in the air. Overall performance is very similar to the hearth powered 50 horsepower Sherwood Cub. 
in almost every respect, which isn't surprising because the wing area overall size and weight are all quite closely matched. At this point, the only thing that remained to be done was a low-level pass of the airfield for David to photograph, followed by a tight circuit and an acceptable landing. As I flared and cut the throttle, I swapped hands to apply a gentler touch to the joystick. We touched down pretty much in a three-pointer, no drama, and very easy to accomplish in this docile SSDR biplane. This is a cracker of an SSDR with no vices or surprises, and the epitome of low-cost flying. You can build an SSDR uh, such as this from plans only or by constructing it from a kit. No oversight is needed from the authorities and if built from plans and the hardware kit I'm sure that it could come in at less than 8,000 pounds or US $10,500. Alternatively around 15,000 pounds or US 19 uh, for a quick build kit plus engine is as cheap as chips. Thanks again for watching. We try hard to bring you interesting content each week. To help us out, please like and share our videos if you feel the content is worthy. To receive the latest info from Fisher Flying Products, click the subscribe button and ring the bell. See you next time in the nest.